Hey guys and welcome back. So in today's video I am bringing you another programming problem and solution. Now I do these once a week so make sure you guys are staying tuned for those. I typically try to release them on like Monday or Tuesday um, but at least once a week I'm trying to get one out now. It's a new thing that I've kind of been starting. So essentially the problem we're doing today is call is a basically a maze traversal problem. Now, I'll go through the exact specifications, but I'm not going to read this entire thing. So if you want to read this, it'll be on my website. There'll be a link in the description. You can go there and they'll have the PDF and you can have a look at it. Also, I don't make these. Uh, I just find I got this off of the Waterloo website. They do some programming competitions for high school students and I believe university as well. And they have a bunch of really complicated and good programs or problems on there. And they also have the solutions in the test files. So that's typically where I take my problems from. Now anyways, uh, so essentially what we're going to be doing here is we're defining a maze and we have to find a way given any start room, so starting in like room, so there's a maze of a bunch of different rooms, a bunch of different corridors that connect those rooms, given a starting room, we have to figure out how long it could possibly take us by traversing the maze to get back to our starting room. So essentially taking any path throughout the maze. How long is the maximum time? Like if we took the longest path, how long would it take us to get back to that starting room? And we're going to do this in a certain way, which you'll see in a second. So the main kind of constraints on this maze are that we have N rooms connected by different corridors. Uh, each room is in the shape of a circle. Now each corridor forms connection between two distinct rooms. So no corridor goes into the same room. There's no like big loop that goes into the same room, which is actually really nice for us. Um, no two corridors will connect the same pair of rooms which again is also very nice, which means that there's not um, two pathways going from like room one to room two. There's only one way to go from room one to room two. Now each room will have at least one cor corridor that connects to it. So that's not really that important, but essentially it means we don't have any floating rooms that are inaccessible that we can't get to. Or like we start in a room and there's no way to get out of it, something like that. Okay, so essentially the way that it's saying to navigate through this maze is since uh, the lights are out, that's what uh, like, the problem is the lights are out in this maze. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, in our starting room, place our right hand on one of the, uh, somewhere on the wall. So since it's a circle, obviously it's one wall, but somewhere on that wall, we'll place our right hand. Now determining where we, where we put our right hand, uh, will take us into different corridors. So we could place our right hand like maybe near corridor one or corridor two, and then we'll just keep following that, uh, in a counterclockwise direction until eventually we end up back into our original room. If you don't know, this is a thing with mazes. Uh, if you're ever stuck in a maze, you put your hand on the right wall and you just follow that right wall until eventually you end up at the exit or uh, what do you call it? Like back where you started or something like that. I don't know how this works mathematically, but it does. Uh, but it is to be noted that this could take you a very long time. And that's what this is asking for. How long could it take us? So that's how that kind of works. Um, so yeah, now there's a bunch of input specifications, output specifications and whatnot. I mean, if you guys are going to attempt to solve this problem, I assume you'll be able to figure out how these work by just reading through them. So I'm not really going to bother. But what I'll do is quickly go through an example of how uh, the steps that we should take to solve this, talk about the algorithm I'm going to use, and then go into the solution. Now, I'll note this is a very complicated problem. If you're not in university, I don't expect you'd be able to solve this. Even for myself, like we haven't learned how to do this in class. I had to do a bit of a research to kind of figure out the best way to approach this. And my solution is far from perfect. I'll tell you that. So what I'm going to do is just load up a little drawing thing here and let's do an example starting room at one. So essentially the input, right? It gives us a maze and our maze looks something like this. So it's saying like one is connected to three, three is connected to one, two connects to five, five to four, four to six, two to four. That's what this is our maze layout. Now note that this is the same maze. I know that one, like these are not connected in any way, but that's perfectly fine. You can have kind of floating components. Now, let's say we start in room one. What is the maximum amount of corridors we have to pass through before we get back to room one? Well, we got to go. So we'll pick up, we'll put our hand on any place on the wall. Let's say we choose here. Okay. And we're going to go counterclockwise like this and keep our hand on that right wall. So that'll mean it'll bring us to here and then we'll go to here and then we'll come back. So we kind of went like that, which means that we pass through this corridor, not one, but two times. So the maximum amount of times to get back to room one, starting in room one is two. Now, obviously this is very simple because there's only one room that connects to room one. So obviously that would be the only way this works, but say three branched out like this and three went into another room. Well, if we put our hand here and we go and we go, well, we're on this right wall, which means that we now have to go into here 
and then we go here and then we go back 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 so it would take us uh what do you call it four steps to do this because we had to go through this corridor twice so two like that then we had to go through this corridor twice so it took us four steps to do that so that's just another example now down here let's say we start in room two well uh we're gonna place our walls place our hand somewhere on the wall but here's the thing we can place our hand somewhere on kind of like this section of the wall or we could place it right here now do you know why this makes a difference where we place our hand like if we place it somewhere here or if we place it somewhere here why will this make a difference well let's think about this for a second if we decide to place our uh hand on the wall here where i'm making the red dot well we're going to go counterclockwise which means we're going to go this way we're going to follow this right wall so we're going to do something that looks like this until we end back up in the room which means we went through one two three corridors and we ended back up in room number two now that's fine that works but let's contrast that to if we put our hand here same process we put our hand here now we're going to go counterclockwise and what we're going to do though is we're going to follow this path right and now we're going to go into six which we didn't go into before we're going to come back up into five and loop back in to here now that's one two three because we had to go through this corridor first or twice sorry four five so as opposed to the first solution we got which was three now we have five which means five is the maximum to get back into this room starting in this room and i mean i can show you examples for all the other ones but i think you guys probably get the point now this is actually a really simple example of the maze i know this might seem a bit confusing because you have like paths connecting like that but now imagine that this goes on and it looks something like this okay and then these are connected and then there's one connected here and then this one connects to this room and then that connects to this right like geometrically this doesn't have to make sense the maze that it gives you it just gives you connections right so i mean like it, let's say we start here and we go into five well we could go back like that but if we come into five on this angle right so if we come from four to five and we keep our hand on that right wall now we're going to go into here and then we're going to go into this and then we're going to go into this and then right wall we're going to go here and then we're going to go here and now we're in six and now we're back right wall and now we're back into five um right and then we go into this again so that that's not a possible solution so, right so like that is um somewhere that we could run into an issue so we're going to go through the kind of my solution and how this works but let's quickly talk about something called a q-based algorithm which is what i'm going to use to solve this problem now essentially what i want to do is i want to try every single path that I can because I need to find the maximum distance to get into this uh, like in back into this room so for this room we'll just stick with example two what I did was I said well what are the neighbors of this room well the neighbors I'm saying are gonna be four and they're gonna be five now these are the two rooms that I could possibly like these are my options right when I start in room two I can go into room five or I can go into room four those are the two options I have so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say okay so these are our options well we start in room two now we can go into room five or we can start in room two and we can go into room four. Those are my two options. Now let's think about this though. Okay, let's go back there. If I start in room two, so now let's say I decided, let, let's cross this one out. Let's say I decided to go into room five. Okay, that's the one I picked. Well, what are my options now? Let's think about it. We have to def determine how we came into room five to figure out what room we're going to go into next because well let's think about this if i come in from this way and i'm on the right wall i need to go into room four right but if i came in from corridor four i would have to go into corridor two right i'd have to go to room two so we have to determine how we came in to pick the next room we're going to go to so what we'll do is we'll look at this and we'll say okay so we went from room two to room five so that corridor is located here right so what's the next corridor counterclockwise that's closest to us well that's this corridor as opposed to let's pretend there was another one here okay that went into a room like that okay so we need to go into this corridor so we say okay so we went into five now since we went into five and we used that specific corridor which was two to five well that means that now we'll change this and rather than going from two to five we're going to go from two to five and then the next one we have to go to is four so we'll put four like that we continue this process so what we do now is we say okay well let's see here so now we've we've essentially the path we've done is we've done two to five and now we're back to four now from four where do we go well again it matters how we came into four because there's three ways to get into four you could go in from six two or five so we came in from five so we're on this right wall right 
So now we have to look and find the corridor that's the most counterclockwise, um, the closest counterclockwise to us. That's going to be this corridor, which goes from four to two, which means that now the next room we have to go into is two. Okay, sweet. So we've done this. We've now, the first one is the same as the last one, which means that we've reached the original room. And how long did it take us? Well, one, two, three corridors, right? Because I mean, you just count the, the connections between the rooms, right? Like that. Okay. So that's how that worked. Now that's one possible solution, right? So we've exhausted this, we've created this and we said, okay, so this leads to, to a value of three. But what was the other solution that we decided not to, to determine or not to go on yet? Well, that was two and four. So let's try two and four. Now let's clear all this and let's do two and four. Well, two and four is like this, right? So we go here and remember we're on this kind of outside wall like that. All right. So if we come into four, now we came in from corridor two to four. So what's the next room we have to go into? Well, since we're on this right wall and we're following that, that means we got to go into the next most counterclockwise thing, which is six. So now we go from four to room six. Now let's look at this. So six, let's find the most counterclockwise room or corridor to four, like from coming in on four. Well, that's actually four itself. And that work that works fine. We can go through the same corridor twice because it only has one corridor connecting to it. So that's kind of a case is if you go into a room and it only has one corridor connecting into it and it's not the same room that we started in, just go back the other way. But that still counts as a traversal because that's what we had to do, right? So we go six and then we go back to four like that. So now let's let's look at this, right? So now what our path looks like is we've gone from two to four into six and now we're back into four. But this time when we come in four, what side do we come in? We don't come from two anymore. We're coming from six, which means that we go to the next most counterclockwise thing, which is five. And then we go in five. Okay. So let's add five here. And then from five, what do we do? Well, most counterclockwise, which is two. So we go into two and then obviously, well, we found our solution and now it takes one, two, three, four, five to do that. So that is our answer. And that's how the solution works. Uh, and what we do to kind of simulate this, right, is, well, uh, we start with a few different paths. We start with two, five, two, four, and then we extend out and just kind of follow and loop through the maze and then get a list of a certain size. And once eventually we have the start and the end the same, we've gotten back into that room, which means that we're done. We found a solution. We're good to go. Awesome. All right, so my solution uh, I'm going to show you now is it, it does exactly what I just showed you, except in code form. Now, it's a bit confusing. Uh, obviously, reading someone else's code is not that easy, but I'm going to try to walk you guys through it and show you exactly how it works. So just stay tuned for one second. OK, so what I'm going to do for you guys now is run my script and show you it working and then point out some kind of the flaws in it and why the solution is not amazing, but works. So essentially the solution that I'm about to show you is exactly what I talked about. It works in the exact same way. It follows that procedure. Now it uses what's known as a breadth first search algorithm, which essentially is what, what I showed you just creating a bunch of different paths and then kind of finishing those paths using what's known as a queue. Now this is a queue based algorithm. I'm not really going to talk exactly about what that is. I have a video on my channel that explains that. Uh, if you need a link to that, let me know and I'll send one in the description or whatever. But anyways, uh, these are all of the test files that we have. So essentially you can see um, we have these in files and these out files. Now the in files, obviously like the number in number out correspond to some sample input and the expected output. Now what I did is just wrote a nice script that automated this process of testing all the in files and out files on my solution and then determining how many I got correct, how many took too long or how many I got wrong. Now essentially you can see that uh, some of these files are quite large. For example, let's look at maze 18 uh, or even let's look at this one, maze 25. If I edit this, um, you can see that this goes on for a long time. In fact, we have 200,000 lines of input. So simply even reading this input in alone takes a long time, uh, let alone processing the information. So we have 100,000 rooms and then for every single one of those rooms, we have to determine how long it's going to take. So you can imagine that like 
a slow solution, which is something that I have, will not really work for this because it takes so long. So there's obviously something that could be improved for my solution. Uh, and I want you guys to help me. If you have a better solution, please like show it to me, uh, comment it down below, because I've been trying to find a way to optimize this and I can't uh, figure it out yet. So anyways, that's kind of like some of what the input looks like. Uh, I'll show you an output file, just so you can get an idea. This is not the corresponding one, but uh, output, right? Like, like that's what an expected output is. So anyways, uh, let's run this and I'll show you kind of how this, this works. So I time all my solutions just to see how long they actually take. And I can give, so I can see if I'm improving them when I'm making modifications, but the timeouts are, uh, I time out ever after half a second. So essentially if it takes more than half a second to find the solution, I just say timeout because I really don't want to sit here for a long time. Like technically if I ran this for a day, it would get all the solutions, but I don't want to do that, especially not for the video. So anyways, you can see here, so there's 28 problems. I got 11 correct, 17 timed out, zero were incorrect. Well, I mean, if you consider the timed out ones as no answer. And then um, it just gives me kind of an outline of the pound sign means I got it correct. Uh, T means timeout. And then so you can see all the different ones. So I just wrote the script that does this for me. It's not really a part of the solution. It just automates the testing. So anyways, let's get into the code now and talk about all this. So this, what I'm about to highlight is the automated tester. So what it does is essentially just opens all the in files and the out files in the directory, and then just calls the function uh, run to get an answer for the given for given input. And then based on that answer compares it to the, the expected answer. And then it'll tell you if you got it correct, incorrect, keep track, and then, you know, give you a nice little output at the end. I think it's a really easy way to test your programs really quickly. Now the actual solution is down here now, essentially, right? Like, I'll, I'll read through this, but it is kind of complicated how it works. Um, and you're going to have to look at it on your own if you really want to understand it. But essentially, given some kind of input, what we're going to start by doing is we'll create a blank maze dictionary. And what this is going to represent is kind of the data structure of our maze. So it's going to store a bunch of keys, which are between zero and the amount of rooms. And each of those keys will be uh, corresponding to a node. Now, those nodes are what is here. Now, this node simply is just an object that stores uh, all of the neighbors of a given, what do you call it? Uh, like room. So for example, all of the connections to that room, that's what we're storing. I mean, I didn't really need to do this as a class, but I just felt like doing it as a class. Uh, and that's all it's storing here. So that's how we kind of are storing things in here. Now, when I get the input, I got to split it up into the different parts, which is obviously the, uh, the actual room layout. And then the rooms that I need to be cal doing calculations or doing the solutions for. So I do that. Uh, I just get the time before we start running the solution so that I can see, you know, how long it took to do something. Uh, then I'm converting each line of input uh, into integers because I need everything in ints. And then just, uh, what do you call it, setting up this data structure of the maze with the key I, which is the room I, uh, and then all the given neighbors. Now, this is the actual real solution. That's kind of just setting things up. Uh, and since we're going to have to do a certain amount of queries, which is like however many rooms they ask us to do calculations for, we need to do uh, the solution for each room. So I do this. Uh, this is going to be the current max value of the solution we're looking for. So essentially, how long so far has it taken us to get back to the same room? Pretty straightforward. Now I use uh, a queue, just simply imported that from Python import queue, really standard. And then what I'm doing is I'm initially starting off by setting up the paths that we could take. Now those paths Right, and that's what this for loop's doing are the ones that I talked about before. Like starting in room two, we could go to room four, we go to room five, we go to room seven, right? That's what we start off with there. And then I add those into a queue and we constantly strip off one of the possible solutions from the queue uh, and then just keep trying essentially is what we do. So um, while the queue is not empty, so while we haven't looked at every single possible solution we have, keep trying. Now this is just responsible for the timeout. It's simply saying if it takes more than half a second, just, just quit, we're done. Uh, this is gonna DQ, which means get whatever solution we should be working on next. So either adding to it, checking if it's finished or moving into a new room. Cause each time we run this loop, uh, we for a given solution, we go into like a different room. That's, that's how it works. Then we'll check based on whatever the current solution is. We'll say, well, if the last element in that solution is equal to whatever room we're in, like the way that I showed you, that means we've successfully gotten back to our room. So we'll check if this, uh, the length of that solution is greater than our current max. If it is, we'll simply say MX is equal to, so our max, the length of current. 
Otherwise, what we do is we're going to copy the solution and we're going to add to it. And we're going to add to it the next room we need to go into. So what I'm doing here is simply just checking uh, if there's only one neighbor, we just need to go back into the previous room. So that's what this if statement does. But down here, we're simply just going to go to the next clockwise room. And that's what all this is doing. Uh, just making sure that we're going into the like the next room that we should be going into. And then I'm just checking here and saying, you know what? Well, if at this point uh, we already gotten in, this is meant to speed things up a bit. If we've already reached that room that we need to be in, then just add one because, well, it'd be one more solution to get in, one more step to get in and then add that to the queue. Now I'm storing all these in the output and then we're simply returning that at the end. And this is how this solution works. Now, again, this is very really slow because it's a queue based algorithm. So there's a ton of different steps and it's running through like millions of times, uh, tons of operations. If you guys have a better solution to this, please don't hesitate to let me know. Really interesting problem. If you're able to solve this, give yourself a pat on the back because it is complicated. Uh, and with that being said, I'd love to hear your guys feedback on this. I know this was a difficult problem, but I want to give some of you more advanced people uh, something to look into and to challenge yourself with. Uh, so with that being said, I guess I will wrap up the video here and I'll see you again in another one.